It is said the Deep Ones were a queer misshapen race of half-men sired by creatures of the salt seas upon human women, that these sea creatures are the truth behind the drowned god of the Ironborn. Some readers suspect the Deep Ones were behind the annihilation of the Maze Makers of Lorath. As local legends suggest, they were destroyed by an enemy from the sea. Some tales specify this enemy as Merlins, when apparently the Deep Ones inspired the legends of Merlins, much like their fathers inspired the belief of the Drowned God. Yet, who were the fathers of the Deep Ones really? How are sea creatures the truth behind the Drowned God? In Ironborn lore, their god was not always drowned. He was only later drowned and reborn from the sea. Which raises the question, if sea creatures are the truth behind the Drowned God, how could they even drown? And why would they even mate with humans in the first place? Were the Deep Ones intentional or an accident? Could their fathers have had any motives at all? Were they really just sea creatures? Just animals? Well, there is a perfect answer to all these questions, hinted at in the first three books of A Song of Ice and Fire. Old Nan says the children knew the songs of the trees, that they could fly like birds and swim like fish. Supposedly, the Green Seers also had the power over the beasts of the wood and the birds in the trees, even fish. The Green Seers were more than that. They were wargs as well, as you are, and the greatest of them could wear the skins of any beast that flies or swims. The fathers of the Deep Ones may have been none other than the Green Seers of the Children of the Forest. This would explain how the sea creatures which inspire the Drowned God were drowned and reborn from the sea in Ironborn lore. Because this would mean they weren't sea creatures at all, but skin-changing green seers. When green seers and skin changers die, they live a second life in their animals. Thus, if one's animal was a sea creature, they would have a second life reborn from the sea, just like the drowned god. The children being part of the drowned god would also tie in with their gods, because some of their gods are the gods of the streams, of water, essentially. Obviously, this is said because the children go into the fish of the streams when they die, the children become part of this godhood, so why not the fish of the sea as well, which are the truth behind the drowned god? Furthermore, when skin changers wear the skins of animals, they risk the terrible fate of losing themselves in their creatures forever. Thus, if they lost themselves in creatures of the sea, they would, in a sense, drown. Which brings to mind this curious metaphor used in the show. It is beautiful beneath the sea. But if you stay too long, you drown. Even more curious is the fact that Bloodraven told this to Bran because he was outside of his skin too long. So could the Drowned God have actually been Green Seers who stayed too long beneath the sea, so long that they drowned and remained creatures of the sea? However, why would these Green Seers of the Children then mate sea creatures with humans? Well, seeing as how it resulted in the creation of the Deep Ones, who were likely behind the annihilation of the Maze Makers, the answer could be very simple and surprisingly familiar. The children's intentions may have been to create monsters, to defeat their enemies. But why would the Maze Makers be enemies of the children, and were they even in the same continent at one point? For starters, the Maze Makers were essentially half-giants, as their bones tell us they were massively built and larger than men though not so large as giants. Some have actually suggested they had been born of human men and giant women. This is important to know because giants were enemies of the children for the longest time. Giants were the greatest foes of the children. One of the children Bran meets even tells him giants were once the bane of her people. So they were arch enemies once, the children and giants. With the Maze Makers being half giants, it only makes sense that the children extended their antagonism toward the Maze Makers. However, before delving deeper into their relationship, we must ask, is there any evidence the Maze Makers were even in Westeros? Well, they may have actually left a trail of clues in Essos that ultimately do lead to Westeros. The Maze Makers mostly built their mazes on the Lorathi Isles, with some of their mazes leading underground, descending 500 feet. However, one maze, badly overgrown and sunk deep into the earth, has actually been found on mainland Essos. So we at least know they were capable of leaving their isles. And sure enough, far away on another isle off the coast of southern Essos lies the Isle of Leng, home to abandoned cities, remnant of some vanished people, much like the vanished maze makers. The people who left behind this remnant were likely the old ones of that same isle, 
who lived deep below the overgrown subterranean cities, much like the overgrown mazes sunk deep into the earth of the maze makers. These old ones built massive buildings and labyrinths of tunnels, and carved steps that descend hundreds of feet into the earth. Once again, much like the maze maker's very own labyrinths that include passages descending 500 feet. But for everything to fall into place, we only need to look at the size of the current natives of Lang, logically the descendants of the old ones. They are perhaps the tallest of all the known races of mankind, with many men amongst them reaching 7 feet in height and some as tall as 8. It seems the natives have some giant's blood in them, just like the maze makers. I believe the maze makers were the old ones of Lang, and all this has been important to establish because Lang is an isle of the Jade Sea, and the Jade Sea is one of two locations where dragons originated according to Book 1. She had heard that the first dragons had come from the east, from the Shadowlands beyond the Shy, and the islands of the Jade Sea. But what corroborates this rumor is the specific islands in the Jade Sea, introduced many years after Book 1 in the World of Ice and Fire. Other islands of note in the Jade Sea, as recorded by Corliss Velaryon in his letters. Marahai, the Paradise Isle, a verdant crescent attended by twin fire islands, where burning mountains belch plumes of molten stone day and night. Given all the hints in the books that dragons preferred hot areas of volcanic activity, such as dragons thriving best on Dragonstone, where the volcano Dragonmont is located, that dragons preferred making their lairs in its smoky caverns, and that they liked keeping their bulk of dragon eggs beneath it, it is likely true that dragons also came from the Jade Sea, specifically from the twin fire islands near the Old Ones, or Maze Makers, who could have tamed them, much like someone else tamed the dragons in the shadow. But now we can go to Westeros, because in Westeros, on yet again another isle, is yet again another labyrinth. This is a labyrinthine black stone fortress that makes up the base of the high tower at Old Town. It predates the upper levels of the tower by thousands of years. Its walls are described as massive, likely because these massive walls were originally built for massive people, the half-giants. So we have labyrinthine interiors and massive walls, which evoke the ruins of Lang and their massive buildings and endless labyrinths. More importantly, the passages within the fortress strike many as being tunnels rather than halls. Once again, recall and compare to the endless labyrinths of tunnels found on Lang. The passages strike many as being tunnels because that is exactly what they were meant to evoke, which also explains why their architecture is plain and unadorned. The fortress having been fused by dragon flame has led some to believe it of Valyrian origin, yet many characteristics obviously point to someone else, the strongest possibility now being the maze makers. There are many theories regarding who built the fortress, yet only this one can explain why their halls are massive and seem like tunnels, with architecture that is plain and unadorned. And few can explain why a civilization other than the maze makers would have built this maze. Even one archmaester suggests it was the work of the maze makers. Another maester admits his notion is intriguing but raises more questions than it answers. One question being, where would the maze makers have gotten dragons? My answer being the Jade Sea on the Twin Fire Islands. However, now that we have archaeological evidence of the half giant maze makers, or old ones, having been in Westeros, we can delve into a legend that not only corroborates this, but also suggests that the Half-Giants fought the Deep Ones. Here's the legend of Sir Clarence Crab of Cracklaw Point, recounted to Brienne by Nimble Dick in The Feast for Crows. Sir Clarence Crab. He was 8 foot tall, and so strong he could uproot pine trees with one hand and chuck them half a mile. No horse could bear his weight, so he rode on Alrox. Sounds like a half-giant, doesn't he? If legend is not enough, Brienne even has a vivid nightmare of Sir Clarence, where she sees him as huge and fierce, mounted on an Alrox shaggier than he was. The giants John saw north of the wall are also described as shaggy, but quite a deal more considering they are full giants, more bear-like than human, and as woolly as the mammoths they rode. Shaggy pelts covered their bodies, thick below the waist, sparser above. So it makes sense that the half-giant Clarence Crab was also shaggy to some degree. Now let us hear of the enemies he fought. Nimble Dick talked about the time Sir Clarence Crab had fought the Squisher King. 
Who was the Squisher King and who were the Squishers? They look like men till you get close, but their heads is too big, and they got scales where a proper man's got hair. Fish belly white they are, with webs between their fingers. They're always damp and fishy smelling, but behind these blubbery lips, they got rows of green teeth, sharp as needles. They come by night and steal bad little children, padding along on them webbed feet with a little squish squish sound. The girls they keep to breed with. The squishers quite obviously seem like the deep ones. Their being in Westeros is actually further speculated in the world of ice and fire. The beasts of the wood and the giants were eventually joined by other greater dangers, however. A possibility arises for a third race to have inhabited the Seven Kingdoms in the Dawn Age. Among the Ironborn, it is said that the first of the first men to come to the Iron Isles found the famous sea stone chair on Old Wick, but that the Isles were uninhabited. If true, the nature and origins of the chair's makers are a mystery. Maester Kurth, in his collection of Ironborn legends, songs the drowned men sing, has suggested that the chair was left by visitors from across the Sunset Sea. Another maester speculates these visitors were the Deep Ones. So the Deep Ones, or Squishers, may have battled the half-giant maze makers, or Old Ones, on Westeros long ago. This would explain why the isle where the maze makers built their fortress is called Battle Isle. Yet mysteries remain. The stony island where the high tower stands is known as Battle Isle, even in our oldest records. But why? What battle was fought there? When? Between which lords? Which kings? Which races? With all this established, we can now delve deeper into why the children may have wanted to defeat the maze makers, along with why they built their mazes. First, we must recognize that both children and giants were fond of living in caves, even inhabiting the same caverns at times, such as those beneath Casterly Rock. However, this has led to conflict, according to one tale. The Wildling brothers Gendo and Gorn were called upon to mediate a dispute between a clan of children and a family of giants over the possession of a cavern. It was a part of a greater chain of caverns that eventually passed beneath the wall. Great chains of underground caverns are also found in Essos. In Norvos, for example, are caverns that honeycomb the endless hills. One cavern system, some hundred leagues northwest of Norvos, is so vast and deep that legend claims it is the entrance to the underworld. Lummis Longstrider visited it once, and even counted it as one of the world's seven natural wonders. However, children and giants were also found in Essos. So, I believe this tale of a dispute between children and giants over a cavern serves as a microcosm, a smaller scale model of a grander conflict that could have once spanned across both continents. Children and giants fighting for supremacy over what the Novoshi call the underworld, but we may call Subterranea. I dub it Subterranea in reference to a comic book in which there dwelt various ancient races that warred beneath the earth. Their dwelling was called the Subterranea. And that comic book was Stan Lee's Fantastic Four, one of George R. R. Martin's favorite comics. He actually said, the first words of mine that were ever published were in Marvel Comics' Fantastic Four Letters column. I believe he drew direct inspiration from this comic, seeing as how he also said, Maybe Stan Lee is the greatest literary influence on me, even more than Shakespeare or Tolkien. Subterranea was introduced in the first issue of Fantastic Four, so George did read of it. Here's its description from Wikipedia. Subterranea is a network of massive caves, passages, and tunnels, some large enough to hold cities, that are inhabited by the various races of subterraneans. Subterranea contains water in underground rivers, pools, and lakes. It consisted of a seemingly planet-wide network of caverns lying miles beneath Earth's surface. We can compare this with what we discover in the Cave of the Children, in which there is an underground river that leads down to a sunless sea, but also passages that go even deeper, bottomless pits and sudden shafts, forgotten ways that lead to the very center of the Earth. In that first issue of Fantastic Four, the villain Mole Man had actually discovered a cavern with a passage that led to the center of the Earth, although this was later retconned. 
Now, a song of sea is mentioned regarding the cave of the children, and curiously enough, caves and sunless seas are also mentioned together in Essos, at the mountain range called the Bones. Even more curious is that those same mountains were once home to the giants of Essos, who are now gone and only leave behind their bones, just like the maze makers. Speaking of bones, however, they may actually serve as evidence of these subterranean wars between the children and giants. The cave of the children is actually home to the bones of thousands dead, and extended far below the hollow hill, with skulls of giants and children. The floor of the passage was littered with the bones of birds and beasts, but there were other bones as well, big ones that must have come from giants, and small ones that could have been from children. On either side of them, in Nietzsche's carved from the stone, skulls looked down on them. Brand saw a bear skull and a wolf skull, half a dozen human skulls and near as many giants. All the rest were small, queerly formed, children of the forest. Most importantly, the bones of giants are also found in those caverns that the Novoshi say lead to the underworld, the subterranea of a song of ice and fire. The most important part about all these underground cave systems, however, is that all throughout the novels and the world of ice and fire, they're consistently described like mazes. That same cavern the Wildling brothers swindled from the children and giants led to an underground described as a labyrinth of twisting subterranean caverns. It was so maze-like that one brother and his people lost their way, never to be seen again. Even the caves of the Westerlands are referred to as labyrinthine caves. However, all this might then explain why the maze makers built their mazes. First of all, we know the maze makers were giants to some degree. Second, we know that giants loved living in underground caverns, their natural habitats. Third, we know these underground caverns are natural mazes. Therefore, the maze makers' constructions may have just been built in homage to their natural habitats as giants. They weren't necessarily building mazes in actuality. They were simply building their homes in the likeness of the maze-like underground. In fact, recall that on both Lorath and Lang, their structures also lead underground. It seems the maze makers were homesick. So perhaps in this underground conflict, the children's feud of the giants extended to the half-giant maze makers. Perhaps in their subterranean wars, the children were being overpowered by these new giants. This is a conflict the children would definitely lose alone. The maze makers were capable of building massive complex structures, and one of their constructions, the base of the high tower, was evidently made using dragons, the ultimate weapons. To get an idea of how far advanced they were before everyone else, remember that the base of the high tower predates the upper levels by thousands of years. In fact, even the first human built levels were only wood after the maze makers vanished. That is how far advanced they were. These colossi were pitted against the small and scant children, whose magics even struggled against the primitive first men. And I've not even begun speculating on the types of weapons the maze makers may have possessed besides dragons. As said before, this conflict the children would certainly lose alone. This would have been a war that, if lost, could have brought about their extinction. Just like with the first men, it would have been a war for survival, because although the maze makers were half giant, they were also half men. The children of the forest actually call themselves the Singers, and after a conversation with one of them about their extinction, Bran begins to compare the Singers with men. Men would not be sad. Men would be wroth. Men would hate and swear a bloody vengeance. The Singers sing sad songs, where men would fight and kill. So, faced with this threat of half-men, half-giants, what could the Singers have done? Well, I believe they stayed true to their name, the Singers, and they sang the Song of Water, the Deep Ones, to defeat the Maze Makers. Just as they thereafter sang the Song of Ice, the Others, to defeat the First Men. Because their magic is called singing, such as when they used their powers to part Westeros from Essos, using the Hammer of the Waters with a song they sang. Thus, if the Singers then used magic to create special beings, these beings could then be called their song. And in this series, the word song has multiple meanings, as George once spoke on the title of a song of ice and fire. 
I like titles that work on several different levels, where the title seems to have an obvious meaning but, if you think about it, also a secondary meaning, perhaps even a tertiary. That's what I'm striving for here. Having said all this, I must then bring up the sacred oath of House Reed. I swear it by earth and water. I swear it by bronze and iron. We swear it by ice and fire. I believe the Reed's oath is referencing the greatest clashes in history. Earth represents the maze makers who lived deep in the earth. Water represents the deep ones who dwelt underwater. Bronze represents the first men who wielded bronze against the Andals who wielded iron. Ice represents the others against the Valyrians who represented fire. And they technically did clash during the Long Night, because the last hero defeated the others with dragon steel. What Sam and John believe was Valyrian steel, further corroborated by George himself, saying the Long Night happened closer to 5,000 years ago, at a time when the Valyrians were rising. Now, why would the Reed's Oath reference all these conflicts? Well, the Reeds are Cranogmen, and the Cranogmen grew close to the Singers, even possibly intermarried. The Cranogmen remember what their trees remember, and the trees remember the secrets of the old gods and the Singers, all their songs and spells, their histories and prayers, everything they knew about this world. Furthermore, considering that the Singers essentially become part of the Earth when they die, and they likely partake in blood sacrifice, the greatest conflicts on Earth may well be the greatest blessings to the Singers, because the Earth is fed the blood of the Fallen. This would explain why the Kranogmen honor all these conflicts. However, this theory of an ancient conflict wouldn't be complete without the ancient Ashai and the Five Forts. We shall begin with Ashai, the port city made of greasy black stone. Being greasy black stone, it brings to mind the oily black sea stone chair attributed to the Deep Ones on the Iron Islands, which also brings to mind the greasy black toadstone on Told Isle, where the people are believed to be descended from those who carved the toadstone, for there is an unpleasant fish-like aspect to their faces, and many have webbed hands and feet. Considering the people of Told Isle, and the motif of the stones, one in the shape of a kraken, and another in the likeness of a toad, it seems obvious George wants us associating these greasy oily black stones with a civilization of amphibian humanoids, the Deep Ones. Furthermore, both the toadstone and sea stone chair are noted to be carved, which is in stark contrast to the fortress on Battle Isle having no chisel marks of any kind, which means the greasy oily black stones did not require dragons to make via melting and fusing stone, which means there is a difference between them and the fused black stones, and thus a difference in their creators. The oily greasy black stones are consistently associated with fishy people, so a shy should be no exception. Being situated so close to the ocean, along with having a river running through it, the city seems all too perfect for the Deep Ones. However, Ashai is a profoundly large city, sprawling out for leagues on both banks of the Black River Ash. Behind its enormous land walls is ground enough for Volantis, Karth, and King's Landing to stand side by side and still have room for Old Town. So, it must have been built for a large population. But how could the Deep Ones have once populated this city? How could their fathers have spawned so many of them, stolen away so many human women? Well, we can begin to answer this with another question. If the fathers of the Deep Ones were only sea-dwelling creatures, how would they even acquire human women in the first place? Fortunately, the children of the forest may yet again provide the only answer. Because, why would sea creatures bother hunting humans when they could actually be brought to them on a massive scale? The old songs say that the Green Seers used dark magics to make the seas rise and sweep away the land, shattering the arm. And then the seas came rushing in, and the arm of Dorne was broken and shattered by the force of the water, until only a few bare rocky islands remained above the waves. Legend said the children of the forest had once called down the Hammer of the Waters to break the lands of Westeros in two. Using the Hammer of the Waters, the children could drown whole lands, essentially giving men and women to the sea and its creatures. However, would humans have really drowned along with the land? Was the Hammer of the Waters a cataclysm which could strike so quickly? Well, 
Water magic has been used throughout history by people of the Rhoynar to specifically drown men, and human magic no doubt pales in comparison to the magic of the children. So perhaps human women were served wholesale to the creatures of the sea, to birth the deep ones. I'm not saying this was the actual purpose of the Hammer of the Waters, I am merely saying it would be strategically sound. We can add up all the lands that have sunk into the sea, all the humans submerged with them, and the creatures of the seas may be provided enough women to breed enough deep ones to found a city as large as a shy. However, all of these lands were not sunk so long ago that they coincide with the ancient birth of the deep ones. All except one. Still further east lie the so-called Thousand Islands, believed by some to be the last remnants of a drowned kingdom, whose towns and towers were submerged beneath the rising seas many thousands of years ago. The people of these islands are a queer folk, a hairless people, much like the hairless squishers, with green-tinged skin. They speak no known tongue and are said to sacrifice sailors to their squamish, fish-headed gods. Though surrounded by water on all sides, these islanders fear the sea so much that they will not set foot in the water, even under threat of death. They likely fear the water because their ancestors were victims of the Hammer of the Waters and creatures of the Salt Seas which would also explain why they make sacrifices to squamish, fish-headed gods. In fact, directly south of the Thousand Islands could have once been the children in the forests of Masavi, a cold, dark land of shape-changers and demon hunters. Jojen Reed has suggested shape-changer is simply another name for skin-changer, what the children essentially are. Furthermore, the only other people who called themselves Demon hunters were knights of the Faith of the Seven, the religion brought to Westeros by the Andals, and the Andals hunted the children and saw them as demons. Additionally, everyone in Westeros south of the Wall hunts down skin changers. Therefore, it shouldn't be too far-fetched that these skin-changing demons being hunted in Masavi are the children of the forest. Especially since, in another forest in Essos, called the Kingdoms of the Ifekevron, there lived a small, shy forest folk called the Woodwalkers, described as a gentle race who kept to themselves and their carved trees. The maesters generally agree that these Woodwalkers were kin to the children of the forest. Even more interesting is the fact that the Dothraki shun the force of the Woodwalkers, either out of reverence or fear for their powers, much like they fear the sea. So could it be that the Dothraki fear the sea because their ancestors once witnessed the Hammer of the Waters from the Woodwalkers? But I digress. Now, here is something peculiar about the fish of the Thousand Islands. Even the fish taken from these eastern seas are oddly misshapen with a bitter, unpleasant taste. We can compare this to the fish in the river coursing through a shy, which are blind and twisted, so deformed and hideous to look upon that only fools and shadowbinders will eat of their flesh. In both locations, we have similarly described fish, oddly misshapen and then twisted and deformed, both equally hideous and even distasteful. Yet, we can even further compare them with the Deep Ones, who are queer like the people of the Thousand Islands and misshapen like the fish in its eastern seas. However, now that some connections have been made, putting forth a shy and the Thousand Islands as possible sites of the Deep Ones, what about some place that wasn't theirs? Take a look at this map of Eastern Essos. Look at the Thousand Islands, then a shy, and see what lies so perfectly between them. Most readers theorize the five forts were built against the others. I theorize something else entirely. They were built against a threat found not only to the north, but the south as well. The Deep Ones. One fact immediately supporting my position is the forts themselves. The very nature of their composition fosters defense from all directions. Unlike defenses of the wall, which could not be defended from the south, east, or west, as it was only the north that concerned the Night's Watch. However, if we want to examine threats found only north of the Five Forts, we only need to look to the land of the Shrikes. 
The Shrikes are reportedly half-men with green-scaled skin, who we can compare with the half-human deep ones, the squishers with scales, and the green-tinged people of the Thousand Islands. The Shrikes are also referred to as Lizard Men, and the only other mention of Lizard Men has been near Yin, another city of oily black stone we can possibly link to the Deep Ones. Returning to the Five Forts, however, another discrepancy between them and the Wall that supports my position is the timing of their construction. According to the people of Yiti, the forts were constructed before the Long Night, not in its aftermath as is the case with the Wall. They were constructed amidst the rule of the Pearl Emperor, whose reign supposedly spanned a thousand years. The Long Night happened several successions later by the time of the Bloodstone Emperor. However, regardless of when they were built, it's still puzzling why forts were constructed instead of one long continuous barrier like the wall. Because the undead whites of the others could have just sauntered through the miles between each fort to reach easier targets, namely the greater bulk of humanity. Of course, for most armies, these forts would be treacherous to bypass. The defenders could just ride out to strike from both sides and cut off their retreat, or cut off their supply lines and leave them stranded in the war of attrition. Yet the Whites are not most armies, they do not tire or hunger, and their masters can generate more soldiers wherever there is death. And all this would be during winter. Most importantly, if the defenders in the Five Forts had to leave them in order to defend the South, then the Forts held no advantage over the others. So were the others even in Essos in the first place? The Long Night happened everywhere, which doesn't mean the others did as well. Legends from E.T. only tell of demons, not demons of ice or snow or cold, just demons. And the variously named Azor Ahai is only mentioned fighting darkness. The others are arguably the embodiment of darkness, yet why be so vague when it comes to Essos and Azor Ahai? Compare this to the explicit account of the last hero physically slaying the others with a sword of dragon steel. In comparison, the legend of Azor Ahai fighting the darkness just seems like a filtered depiction of the last hero fighting the others, as if seen through a vision in the flames. Azor Ahai may have just been a vision of the last hero. Both are legendary heroes who defeated evil with a special sword, yet only one can paint a vivid picture. Azor Ahai supposedly led the virtuous men into battle and put the darkness to rout, yet it was the last hero who recruited the children who then banded together the men of the Night's Watch and literally put the others to rout, sending them fleeing north. Considering the last hero's actions led to the founding of the Watch and he wielded a unique sword that could hurt the others, he was likely the one who led the virtuous men, the Night's Watch, into battle and put the darkness to rout, which could have been glimpsed in the vision in the flames on the other side of the world where people wished for a savior, not from the others but from the darkness and cold. Also remember that the figure of Azor Ahai is deeply intertwined with the faith of R'hllor. In other words, my theory is that the people who continuously put their faith in visions seen in the flames may have put their faith in the figure only seen in the flames. Ironically, the truest part of Azor Ahai is probably his prophesied rebirth, because he may have never lived, but someone will fulfill that savior role, and that someone is not going to Essos. Whether it be Daenerys, Jon, or Stannis, isn't it curious that all of them are converging on Westeros? Does Essos not need a savior? Why is Westeros hoarding all of them? It's as if Essos doesn't need to fight the others at all, because they were never there the first time, and the five forts weren't built for them, nor were they built by the Great Empire of the Dawn. Just like the base of the High Tower, the Five Forts are structures made entirely of fused black stone, which predate the rise of Valyria. Being fused black stone, they evidently required dragons to make and someone to command them. The best candidates being the maze makers, considering the clues they are behind the fused black stone on Battle Isle, not to mention the fact that the Five Forts walls are excessively massive. Well, so were the giants in Essos. They were twice as large as the giants in Westeros. In fact, this is strangely reminiscent of what Old Nan said about giants, that they were outsized men who lived in colossal castles. But why would the maze makers not build a maze this time? Well, as my theory goes, they never built any mazes out of necessity, but simply out of fondness for the labyrinthine underground. 
Therefore, if their priority with the forts was defense, they likely sacrificed the mazes for higher walls. Now, legends claim the five forts were raised by the Pearl Emperor, the Great Empire of the Dawn, much like in Westeros, legends claim Bran the Builder built the wall. Yet, here is what George has said about such legends. Much of those details are lost in the mist of time and legend. No one can even say for certain if Brandon the Builder ever lived. He is as remote from the time of the novels as Noah and Gilgamesh are from our own time. And here's some secondhand information from another interview. Bran the Builder is supposed to have built the Wall, Winterfell, and Storm's End. George mentioned that he has become a legend so that people will look at a structure and say, wow, it must have been built by Bran the Builder, when it actually was not. So if at some point you see, they say it was built by Bran the Builder or Land the Clever, realize that it's part of the mythos. If we can't trust the legends claiming Bran the Builder built the Wall, why should we trust legends from the other side of the world claiming the Great Empire of the Dawn built the forts? Well, because they're an empire, right? An empire is capable of such feats. Well, you would still have to prove this mythical empire existed in the first place. Some readers believe the emperors were actually glimpsed as ancestral ghosts in the dream Daenerys had, according to their gemstone eyes, which were opal, amethyst, tourmaline, and jade, matching only four of the great emperors. However, here's what George has said of gemstones and colors in fantasy. The best fantasy is written in the language of dreams. Fantasy is silver and scarlet, indigo and azure, obsidian veined with gold and lapis lazuli. Reality is plywood and plastic, done up in mud brown and olive drab. We read fantasy to find the colors again. This is a very small snippet of a larger quote, but the gist is still there. To George, the colors of gemstones like lapis lazuli may well just be an expression of fantasy. Which would explain Danny's dream of gemstone-colored kings, but would also explain why he named the Great Emperors of the Dawn after gemstones. Because when you already have the Golden Empire of E.T., how do you make the Great Empire of the Dawn sound even more fantastical? Well, Amethyst Empress sounds cooler than Purple Emperors of E.T., and so on and so forth. In all likelihood, these ghosts were simply Danny's Valyrian ancestors depicted in the language of dreams, not the Emperors of the Dawn. Their empire was likely just legend, as was Bran the Builder, and they did not build the forts. With the maze makers, we have bones to know they existed, and contemporaneous structures to know they built things before anyone else. Legends suggest they were destroyed by enemies from the sea. I suggest those enemies were the Deep Ones fathered by the Children of the Forest, and they are the truth behind the Drowned God. But wait, then who taught the Valyrians to tame dragons if it wasn't the Maze Makers or the Great Empire of the Dawn? 